Welcome, Cheryl and Eager. We're happy to have you here in the studio to talk about the U.S. Senate race. I uh, wanted to start off with a question about uh, some of the issues that have come up in this race so far and ask you about the TARP program, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. And uh, the question is, is that good public policy for the United States, and, and why or why not? Well, absolutely not, and I think we've seen the result of it. When you uh, are bailing out failing businesses uh, after the failed policies that preceded it, for example, uh, we were giving risky loans to people who could not follow through on those loans and actually uh, requiring that banks do that. So we're just seeing the consequences of some poor decisions all the way down the road. And I do believe that when we abandoned the free market, we put ourselves into further, um, further uh, problems. And I do agree with Mitt Romney on this one, because he said that uh, it would be better to allow the failing companies to fail, come back around uh, you know, after bankruptcy and restructure, and then uh, be stronger again. And of course, Delta has done it three times. Uh, so you don't think that there's a cascading effect that would have happened that would have uh, made the uh, the recession worse than it than it than it than it is? Uh, it definitely, there would have been a consequence immediately, but it would have been far uh, far quicker in recovery. I really do believe that because we're in essence repeating what happened during the Great Depression, and we're prolonging it now. When you continue to uh, to subsidize and stimulus and, and grow government, what it does is it actually puts a crimp on the free market and private businesses struggle. Let's shift a little bit to health care uh, and, uh, and health care reform. Uh, Senator Bennett, who you're, you're, you're running against uh, as the incumbent, has sponsored a health care reform bill known as the Bennett-Wyden bill uh, with uh, Democratic Senator uh, Ron Wyden from Oregon. What features of that bill, if any, are still relevant to the health care reform debate now? Uh, and should any of those be implemented? Well, some of the components, of course, were dropped into the current uh, President Obama's package. And I do believe that, that that bill is probably still sitting in the wings. I understand after this summit that uh, the Republicans are in line to completely scrap everything and start over from scratch. And I'm sure that Senator Bennett would like to see some of his bill be back on the table again. And uh, there are components of that bill that I would very much disagree with. It is a government, federally government-managed uh, alternative, and uh, some say that it would be more costly. For example, it would require that all business owners provide benefits to their employees. Now, I'm a small business owner, and to, to us what that means is we could have up to 25% extra taxes. And that is really putting a... Um, uh, uh, a blanket over productivity in the, the middle sector of our economy. Um, another thing in the TARP, or excuse me, in the uh, Wyden-Bennett bill is something that I think would be of great concern to Utahns, and that is that uh, insurance companies that are not church-owned are required to provide abortion options. And there is also grant money that is available in there for comprehensive health care provided at school uh, locations. So, those are all things that I find troubling, and this is really troubling. Uh, the IRS would be the uh, entity that would be controlling and managing the premiums, and I, I think that that's a, a very poor decision. Now, uh, one way to think about that bill and other bills is, is that they're bipartisan. So Senator Bennett... Uh, came to an agreement with Senator Wyden in terms of what to propose in that bill and that necess necessitated some level of compromise. Are there circumstances uh, under which you would co-sponsor co a bill with, with a Democrat? And, and if so, what are those circumstances? When would you reach out and compromise and, and co-sponsor something with a member of the other party? Well, it would probably take a conservative Democrat for me to be compromising because what's been happening over the years is uh, Republicans are taking the worst parts of the bills out and then, and then saying, okay, now it's acceptable. And so this is like a house sale. You know, the seller's going to set the price and they know the margin, all right, and the bottom line. And really what's happening is that the Republicans are being left the fools in it and they're the losers. So we're compromising on bad bills 
and there's still bad bills, even so, though you remove so the worst under, parts out. Under, specifically, under what circumstances do you stand on principle, and under what circumstances do you compromise? When is compromise acceptable? Well, take, for example, the health care issue. Uh, I personally believe that there is no constitutional authority for the federal government to be only managing and controlling health care. You try and find that in the Constitution, and I'll buy your lunch. Uh, Article 1, Section 8 is very specific on the limited enumerated powers of the federal government. And although in that section of the Constitution it says provide for the general welfare, that is specific to the limited enumerated powers that are within that section. And yet we have programs like Medicare and yeah. prescription drug we benefits. Sure do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you would want to do away with those? I or? would absolutely want to phase them out. We did a poll recently of uh, Republicans most likely to vote in a primary. And we asked this question, is health care a constitutional right? 99% of respondents said, no, it's not. So at least Republicans in Utah get it. Okay, let's talk about the Constitution for a minute. We hear uh, candidates pressing for a return to constitutional principles. Uh, so specifically, what provision of the Constitution uh, is, is most in danger uh, that, that needs to be defended or, or uh, that we're in, uh, Well, uh, we just talked about Article 1, Section 8. I agree with John Shattuck and the House and also um, Tom Coburn in the Senate that the Enumerated Powers Act is a measure whose time has passed and is well due. Uh, and that one would require that any bill that comes across a senator's desk would have to be scrutinized based on its constitutional authority. So I think that that would be a first step, and that's something that I would champion. Uh, and I hope that in, in 2010... In terms of laying out the, the, specific, new, the specific constitutional grant of authority to do acts or policy. That's okay. correct. So you look at the bill that comes across your desk, and you say, where is this in the Constitution that gives us, as a, as a Senate, to act on this measure? And if it's not there, then it's got to go back to the states. And so with regard to the entitlements, over 60 percent of our budget now tied up entitlements, we've got to look at those entitlements, which are all bankrupt at this point. It's not sustainable. Uh, then we have to say, okay, how are we going to protect those who are already into the system, uh, Social Security, Medicare, and so forth, and how are we going to protect them and yet prepare the upcoming generation for what is going to be happening in the future for them, which I believe is a much more sound uh, policy to just let them know that they've got to plan ahead. They've got to start saving. And isn't that what we teach our children anyway? Let's, uh, let me ask you a little bit about earmarks. Um, uh, when are earmarks uh, appropriate to, to pursue, uh, if ever? Well, an earmark is an appropriation, and uh, the, the Constitution does give Congress, uh, originating in the House, the, the right to appropriate funds. Uh, so you have to decide um, what's the procedure. Now, most earmarks today get dumped in in conference. Nobody's reading them. You'll have 9,000 of them, for example, in the stimulus package that uh, happened uh, around the first of the year. So what's wrong is they're not going through the same process, the hearing process, the committee process. And we have got to separate them out so that we have uh, earmarks that are only germane to the bill that they are attached to. And then I would say certainly you have to scrutinize them again for their constitutional authority. And you have to decide um, whether, if, if it's a private company, say for a defense contract, um, are we going to open this up to an open bidding process? And the answer to that is yes, we absolutely have to. Because right now we're picking and choosing, and that's not a fair process. So if I hear you right, under the right procedural uh, uh, rules, mm -hmm. then these these earmarks or these appropriations are okay, but we need to reform the process. No, no, not that they're okay, okay. but that would be the process okay. by which we would determine whether they're okay. And, and it's, you know, here's, here's the basic question. Where is it in the Constitution that Utah should be paying for sand on a beach in Florida and where Florida ought to be paying for a parking lot in Utah. So would you pursue earmarks for Utah in specific? Uh, it depends. I mean, if it's if within the purview of uh, Congress's authority, for example, to provide for the common defense is definitely uh, one of those 
authorities that Congress has given. So then we have to look at the, the bill. If it's a defense bill, and if that earmark is germane to that bill, then we have to analyze, all right, is this uh, something that we can afford? And uh, is this constitutional? And that's, that would be a very easy uh, scrutiny, I think, to apply. Okay, one final question. I think it's related to this. Uh, if you want to make your best effort to reduce the U.S. budget deficit, uh, what kinds of policies mm -hmm. would you uh, eliminate? Well, that's pretty easy. What kind of programs would you eliminate <laughs> in, in, in priority a, order? Yeah, where yeah. would you start? Well, uh, you know, I agree with Reagan on this. You gotta, you gotta reduce spending and reduce taxes. You gotta uh, allow the private sector to grow. Government doesn't provide jobs. Government uh, actually is part of the problem. So, in um, in budgeting and balancing a budget. You have to uh, eliminate the fluff. I would certainly like to get rid of a lot of the perks that our Congress uh, uh, gives themselves. That would uh, include also pork spending. And a lot of the earmarks are pork spending. So uh, then I would look at the agencies and decide, all right, which of these agencies has constitutional authority? I've been on record for a long time that we ought to get rid of the Department of Education. That was something that Ronald Reagan proposed when he ran for president. So uh, now, in earlier, a few minutes ago, you you mentioned phasing out Medicare. Mm -hmm. uh, where does that fit on your priority list? I think that that's a that's a social entitlement, and absolutely, we have got to start phasing those out. I have confidence in the private sector. In fact, I know that with our capitalist spirit and entrepreneurship in this country that whenever people see a hole and a need, it is filled with that, uh, that Americanism that we have, that you can start from scratch and you can really build something for yourself. So when government takes over, it's competing with the private sector. And it, uh, it just doesn't work that way. That's, uh, that's what's going wrong. So we've got to cut back on the agencies that aren't appropriate. Utah could be absolutely thriving if we did not have the restrictions that the EPA places on our natural resources and access to them. In fact, if you look at our trade policies, which is another subject, but it's a good example, we are now deciding that it, it's a good idea to give GE subsidies to go build nuclear power plants in China, while here in our country, we have had so many restrictions, we can't build those power plants here. So. Um, I think that where there are policies and agencies at the federal level that are duplicated at the state level or could be managed at the state level, that's what we've got to return to. Allow the states to be able to manage. By the way, as you may know, Utah is the best managed state in the nation two years in a row now. So I have confidence that we can do it a whole lot better. Well, on that note, uh, I think we're we're out of time. Thank you so much Thank you. for coming in.